All right, hello and uh, welcome to Startup Business Q&A, episode 147. Uh, this week, the poll was almost unanimous. 90% of you voted for an event uh, related um, uh, event of related um, session rather. So what we've got is a focus on how we do our marketing uh, of events. Now, plenty of stuff's gone wrong and plenty of stuff's gone right for me. So I'm definitely going to be uh, sharing uh, things, uh, my experiences with the last year or so uh, running the Entrepreneur Business Live event. Uh, but if you go back about 12, 13 years, I was also uh, head of uh, sales for uh, an events business, so a corporate side. And, and I looked after the delegate sales and did some sponsorship as well. And one of my clients at the moment, I mean, in fact, two of them have uh, a lot of events that I coach them on as well. So I'm very much immersed in this world uh, at the moment. Thank you everyone who's joining in here. So I've got a few questions from you. It's not gonna be the greatest uh, or rather the longest session uh, today because um, there's quite a few projects on at the moment. And uh, I have to shout out those who are going to be uh, running the Entrepreneur Business Live Melbourne event tomorrow. So Diana, Christina and Tima, thank you so much for all your hard work. If you can, if you can catch it, it's going to be for you night owls, really, uh, in the Entrepreneur Business Group uh, over on Facebook. Uh, we have um, uh, it will be at six o'clock tomorrow <laughs> in the evening, Melbourne time. Uh, and what that means is that's like a nine a.m. UK time. So we're looking at like four a.m. Eastern time, one a.m. Uh, uh, tonight, uh, to, sorry, yeah, 1 a.m. Um, tonight for uh, uh, West Coast. So way into your bedtimes. Uh, but what I do think is if you're able to, uh, if you can't make it, then of course it makes sense to check in with the um, uh, with, with, with the re replay in the group. So without further ado, let's get into your questions. Those of you who are watching, let me know if you're team replay or team live. Hello, Mona Nairi. Hello, Eileen Kelly. Nice to see you. Hello, Ajani. Uh, Julian Smith's watching, good to see you, Alexis Ray, and also Paula Harding, nice to see you, uh, Team UK, nice to see you here, Paula. So, first question's come from Paula Harding, let's answer yours, because you submitted one yesterday, um, and you've asked me, Richard, how often can you promote an event before it annoys people in your feed? Should it be the same promo, or should it always look different? There's, there's two parts to this thing, so, without question, I think you should be doing it differently each time you promote something. So what I mean by that is each piece of content to market your event should have something different to stimulate people. Because if you keep sending the, saying the same thing at people, um, those that were going to go would probably go or they would probably know about it. But even for them, it can get a bit boring and wearing. What we've got to be thinking is you don't, wanna, you don't want people to lose interest. Engagement's great. So let's focus on getting engagement, which means something stimulating and new um, and leverage that, you know, interest to to then promote your event, which is why I do my very best to produce interesting content, which segues into call to action to check out information on events, for instance. So um, I might have a call or an interview with someone. I might have, uh, I might write a piece of content. And if I can draw some line between the theme of an event and that bit of content, then of course those that are watching are now going to see um, that there's also an event running. So it does tend to work that way. I really suggest you don't just bang out the same post over and over again because if you're if you're saying the same thing literally three or four times like the same image over and over again it wears people down a bit it's true that not everyone's going to see it the first time but i still think it's intelligent to continue to do it in different ways and here's the real reason why is because the core body of people who check out your stuff and and connect with you that's your main community, that's your central hub, and they get pretty bored with the same old stuff. So they're showing up for you, right? They're showing up for your channel, essentially. So it makes a lot of sense to give them new and different things. They'll get the gist of it, that you've got the event coming up. So Melbourne tomorrow for Entrepreneur Business Live is a great example of how we've done this. It's multiple piece, points of contact done in so many different ways um, with tagged onto it for those that are keen and interested enough something about the event, okay? In addition, we'll have directly focused content specifically on the event itself. So for instance, um, 
there will be the co-hosts and myself doing a chat or something like that. So recently for the San Francisco event on the 13th of June next month, um, Sarah Gross and I, who's one of the, the speakers with me, um, we did a kind of a web chat and we've I've shared a couple of bits of content on that. So some video footage from it. And after it, what he's basically saying is, is rewarding those that have an interest in Sarah Gross and or myself and saying, you know, if this is interesting, then come meet us in San Francisco. And what we're not doing is making all our content. I reckon probably 80, 90% of all the content that promotes an event is promoted, is, is kind of something else. It's value led. So people are engaging and keen on it. And then it, it, I'd say it segues onto uh, information about the event. So that's the way I would do it. There is no number, but the more you appear the same, the less you can do it. If I was going to post literally the same post, it's twice maximum. But I would never even never even do that, to be honest. On the same platform, I really, I just need it to be different each time because people don't want to show up for you as much. I'm conscious of this, right? Because there's so many events now. I'm, at the moment, I'm talking about Chicago and Phoenix in the next couple of months. And then there's Toronto and Barcelona and, and New York all over again across the summer. And we really run the risk of all my content <laughs> being related to Entrepreneur Business Live, which is great for those interested in Entrepreneur Business Live, but that's not necessarily great for other aspects of what I do and for that part of the community that maybe doesn't hold as much an interest for them or th those who aren't going to go. So with this in mind, it's intelligent to think, you know, you need to punctuate your content with information about your events because the, the main reason why people decide to go is because the, the, the content builds a great community and they're really warm and interested in you, like you wonderful people. And from there, they then pivot into events if they're interested in them. So kind of a notion, uh, noting that that is out there, as you should with all your products, you know, remind them every so often that you've got the course, the consulting, the, uh, the flashy new product, whatever it might be, or the event indeed. Um, and, but the main thing is always to serve through the content first and foremost. So, so I think it's important to kind of have both in mind. Do you want to shout out everyone on um, Instagram? Really appreciate it. So uh, do you want to read the names? Uh, Mirka Lute, I think your name is. Uh, Juliet, I am Terrence, uh, I am Terrence Jr., Mrs. Bartz, Miraculous Moments Productions. Hello there. Uh, Mr. I think your name's Steve. <laughs> uh, Catch Kyle as well. Good to see you here as well. Thank you everyone for joining in there. And Paula, uh, hopefully that helps with your answering your question. We're looking specifically today at marketing your event. This is how we've done it uh, for Entrepreneur Business Live. We've, I think, run something like 13 or 14 events. We've been in four different countries now. Uh, the US, we've been in Canada, we've been on Europe. We're about to do Australia tomorrow. Uh, so we're excited about that in Melbourne as well. Uh, next question from Bob Lowe is how do you create awareness for an event? So it's very general, but what you need to do is focus on the awareness of the event, the kind of a point I've just made, but the, the awareness for the event comes from, from awareness of you. And my approach has been to create awareness of me through my content. So my, my, the, the content is the device, the thing that creates gravity to draw people around me. And that will only work if I'm consistent, full of good value and interesting. So that's why, because I'm not always necessarily interesting, I leverage other people who are. So interesting personalities uh, in my ecosystem I want to share. And of course, they, they, ha they have a network as well. But creating attention and engagement about myself means that then when I reflect on the fact that there's a, an event coming up, that's where the awareness comes, uh, comes from. And <clears throat> even more powerful is the kind of the other side, which is the best uh, awareness really comes from other people. Um, because I feel that that's when you've got advocates and people speaking for you or about you, um, it really makes a point that you're someone worth talking about. If you're the only one that talks about your thing, then it means that maybe not so much, you know, it's not kind of resonating as much with other people. So that's one of the reasons why I'm working with the different speakers for the events, because then they share it. It kind of propagates so much faster that way. Rather than just me being beaten the drum, other people can do it. And as I roll to phase two and three with Entrepreneur Business Live, which is um, me helping to run, and coordinate, but other people actually on the ground running the event, that's phase two, and phase three is someone buying it and running their own thing. 
what I am doing is very much passing the the baton over to them to promote their own event because the dream is eventually that there are so many events that it would be absurd for me to promote them all because I'd just be spamming my network all the time. You see what I mean? So I think that you can create awareness through your own content. Don't go so full tilt that if you're focusing specifically on your thing, as in your events all the time, you should be looking at sharing great content. The thing about what, what was the reason why people kind of were attracted to you in the first place and then leverage that, okay? So if people were interested in me in the first place because of how I demonstrate how to build engagement and how I uh, explain how to communicate um, uh, through in, and sell and things like that because they're the areas I kind of have as my sweet spot. Well, then I need to retain that because that will continue to feed the existing network I've got and get like-minded people near me. But their keenness in that content, it means that they're going to follow through and watch the end of that kind of pieces of content. They'll read it, they'll watch the video or whatever, which is uh, me earning the right to then talk to, talk to them about my event. The mistake and the danger is for someone like me to just pivot away and just talk about Entrepreneur Business Live all the time. And I, I very much am chief evangelist for it, but equally I need to watch it because I could end up very easily banging on about the thing all the time, then it gets a bit wearing for some because that can easily become about the whole, you know, the whole kind of buy a ticket kind of focus. And a good way to keep talking about uh, things, Bob, a good way to kind of build awareness here is to share stories about what's being done. And there are no better stories than from the charity partners we've worked with. So those of you unaware, these events, every single one has a donation to a charity. And by talking about what's that, what that's achieving, it's far more compelling than saying, hey, I've got another event. But can you see, it's far more interesting to say, look at what we've, look what's been achieved through this charity money that's been raised, or look what this charity's done, and we're really excited to be working with them again next month, for instance. So I think that's a really exciting way to do things. It keeps people engaged for the right reasons, as long as you have engagement and attention, well, then you can, as I say, occasionally reflect that you have the events. So if that helps, Bob. Let's do a couple more questions. We're looking at anything to do with marketing your event. If you have a question on the topic, please post it in the comments. But otherwise, we'll just do a couple more. Uh, Abjit Joshi, thank you for your question. He's asked, how do you measure event success? And how do you enhance client experience at an event? Um, one, it depends on the scale of your event as well. And I remember that um, I was at, Vid, this is kind of a large scale event, but I was at VidCon in London earlier this year, which is a big video content creation event uh, at Excel. So it was huge, thousands of people there. And one of the best things about the, um, the event in terms of enhancing user experience was um, the use of Brella, uh, which is an app where you basically say, I'm here, here are my interests and here's where I'm free and it matches you up with everyone there and it kind of sets you up for meetings and things like that. It was brilliant. I met so many great people. I kind of, I got a customer out of it as well, but it allowed me to say, I'm here to talk about this thing. I do these things. These are my sweet spots. Hit me up if you want to hear about this. So I was like, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm a LinkedIn content creator and everyone's like, holy shit, let's hear about this then. And so, of course, a lot of people got involved. Brella is B-R-E-L-L-A. I'm pretty sure that's how we spelt it. But that's one of many types of apps like that. And it was ph phenomenal because I just, you know, I was all through the day getting people pinging me saying, hi, I'd like to speak to you. Can I speak to you? Can I speak to you? That was really excellent. And I think that's, you know, it's one really good way of enhancing experience because you get people interested in you right away. Um, I do think that the... The, the, one of the reasons why I built them in the first place was because they were tremendously dull, these events, um, because there was nothing catering to that experience around the networking side. And again, if we look at networking events, I mean, a lot of the events I'd been to, they'd have some right speakers, but the problem is that it was like, right now go and network, and what does that look like? And it was, you know, that awkward, hi, my name's Richard, here's a business card kind of thing. So the way I've hacked at that, um, Abjit is that I've, I've focused very much on, on, on not necessarily just building a community because I'm part of them, but being present in the communities, uh, you know, localized in certain cities. That's why, for instance, Melbourne tomorrow has this great community of people and, and it means that they're going to be more likely to want to engage and connect. I know that those that are attending 
Many of them know each other. New York two weeks ago is a perfect example of an event just like the one we did in January where, you know, we're looking at <laughs> like 20, 30 people who arrived who knew each other. And it was just a get together and it meant the engagement was so much better. You know, the, the participation, the experience was really good fun. And I look at the communities carefully and I think to myself, well, who is going to be a good speaker to them? Sure, by topic and, and ability. But the other thing that I think people overlook is that in addition to quality of speaker, in terms of their knowledge, their credibility, it's also network. Because if you have a speaker who's well known by the very community that's going to be going, then what happens, it helps it helps bring them in in the first place, but it provides a bit more of a personality that people are aware of. And I, I learned this the hard way because I had an event once uh, I ran um, where the speaker was from a world-class brand. I'm not going to say who it was, but I will say that um, you have that brand in pretty much all of you have it in your wallet. OK, so it's a brand that might be there. And um, this person was right at the top sea level in that in that um, in that space. But the the problem was he had no network as such. No one had a clue who the hell he was. And so I was like, we kind of we, we missed a, a trick there because we had a great level of knowledge, but we didn't have someone who had, a, you know, it's like one percent fame in the space. And I think if someone's got a bit of a personality and ideally it's that kind of, you know, they're online producing content and people know about them and they have active following and things like that. That really makes a difference. So if you look then at those speakers for tomorrow's event in Melbourne, you've got, you know, Tima and Diana and Christina. They are they're like they're monsters on on LinkedIn. So what it's meant, what it means is people will show up and hear from them in terms of the knowledge and the value they can give around their kind of thing they know. But they're also showing up for people because they're they're like you know, they've got people coming because they're, they're aware that these three people are, are, you know, something a cut above the average person. It's not just a knowledge center. It's a kind of a personality as well. I think that really, really lubricates the whole process. So that's important to do. In, in terms of your first part of your question, Abjit, you've asked, uh, how do you measure event success? Um, for me, I'm interested in, and it sounds really cheesy, right, but I'm interested in the people. And when a photographer like uh, my, my uh, photographer uh, Sandy over in um, New York sent me 406 photos after the event a couple of weeks ago. And those those photos have in amongst them so many people smiling and hugging and laughing and things like that. It's just like there's the example of an event that's, in my opinion, is successful. Another way I, I judge success is making sure that I get a load of um, money donated to a charity as well. But you really should think to yourself, what does success look like? There should be a certain number of bums on seats as well, because you want, you know, audience, a client, ex sorry, audience experience is, is really affected by the audience that's around them. If no one shows up, then it's a bit more crap for them. An intimate event of say 20 people even can be brilliant because it's a little, it's a good little body of people who can engage and kind of bounce off each other and things like that. But there's no energy in the room when you've got a tiny set of people, unless it's designed as, you know, a workshop or a seminar really. Um, but, but I really look at event success in terms of um, how much people are sharing and talking about it. Not so much the money. Because it's easy to close sponsors and delegate or attendees rather and things like that. But what, what really is the sign of success is how much momentum am I getting? So I feel that one of the most successful events I ran was New York in January because the momentum out of that was huge. Firstly, it was successful because so many people wanted to come. And I was like, it was like the who's who of content creation on LinkedIn. It seemed to be a very much a LinkedIn vibe, that, that particular event. And so with that happening, I felt like I was like, well, I've got a really group, great group of people and they're all sharing and hashtag EB Live and all that kind of thing. And that was fun, phenomenal. But what was really exciting was after the event, people were saying, you know, when is there one, you know, in Dallas? When is there one in San Francisco? And people wanting to kind of take it on to the next level. So I was really excited by that. Um, so, so that's the thing to think about, you know, what, what does your success look like? And getting on the ground and look at, I, I spent a lot of time uh, when I was at the New York event watching the speakers, but also kind of scanning the room. And everyone's so kind of 
bought into it. The, the energy was fantastic. They were sitting there really like leaning forward, taking notes, engaged, you know, and that suggests to me that we're not being dull. We've, we've got dynamic speakers and we're providing way more than just the space for them to get free food, beer and, uh, and a few business cards. It's much more of a dynamic experience for them. So that really worked for me. Um, let's do one more question here. Daniel Nunes uh, has said, um, uh, so if you have a venue and have support to coordinate and facilitate the event, that's, you know, arguably the hard bit out of the way, the logistics then, um, should it be the same promo? Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong question. What type of follow-up do you do to ensure the participants, including speakers, arrive and contribute? I keep thinking of a house party where you, invite to, you ask those invited to bring something like ice so they have a vested interest in the event. What you're talking about here is how do you get people firstly to actually attend when they've said they would attend, especially the speakers, because so, some people just don't bother. And, and how, do you, you know, how do you get that kind of follow through? How do you get them to participate and, commun- and, and kind of contribute? There is one thing that works really well, Daniel, and I use it all the time. The moment you've got the venue and the date set and you've got the speakers in place, okay, when you've got the three speakers in place in my case, what I do is I, once they're all like, yes, Richard, definitely we're going to be doing it, I then post uh, to social media, to the community, that they're going to be speaking. The graphics made, okay? So San Francisco, it's got the Golden Gate Bridge. It's got Zach Messler, myself, and Sarah Gross on it. They were both, when, when they both confirmed, I had the thing ready to roll. They both confirmed. I confirmed the, uh, you know, a, a few other organizations as well. And it's like, we go, let's see it. And I post it. And thousands of sets of eyeballs see that. And what, what it does is it creates, because what you're talking about here with a house party, it's like your job's bringing the ice, your job's bringing the rum or whatever. You're creating accountability, right? But the strongest accountability I feel is to other people. So when you state, these guys are going to be speaking at the event, it locks it in. And when, you, when that's brought up every so often, and then people are commenting, and you constantly tag them in, and you know, talk them up about how, it, how they're gonna be at the event, it's fantastic, because then people feel like, okay, I'm doing this then. And it becomes quite movable, because no one wants to let anyone down. And if you talk about it enough, they, they know they need to show up. That, that's what I've done, it's been really simple. And I don't give them jobs or tasks to do, Daniel. I don't say, you know, make sure you do this for me or, or can you bring this or uh, I want you to do this, this and this because I don't want to burden anyone with any work. Um, specifically because these are unpaid gigs. I get, you know, uh, a lot of us will take speaker gigs for like five grand or something like that. But this is one that's for free because otherwise I'm, you know, eating into that money from the tickets that goes to... Um, uh, go, goes to charity. So um, it, it's important to make sure you're, you're vocal because then they realise it's really on and that, that's the way to kind of lock people in. That's what I find works. Um, I've only had it once with someone who's like, I have to, I have to bail, man. It was, it was like three days before the event and I was gutted. But it was a personal reason. I was like, cool, no problem. We slotted someone else in. That's, again, why you have a good, strong network. Um, you've also added here, Daniel, what strategies do you have to line everything up prior to posting an event on social media. I mean, it's kind of along the same lines, like nothing else is needed, venue, date, speakers, that's it. And now it's social media. So there's quite a few events in the pipeline. One that you and I are talking about uh, um, with, uh, um, what's the name, Uh, with Phoenix, okay? But there's Chicago and Dallas and all the other ones as well. Um, And they're not being mentioned yet. Firstly, because I don't want to clog up the pipe uh, talking about, uh, you know, Melbourne. But at the same time, what I don't want to do is go on too much. Sorry, my watch is telling me to uh, uh, speak to it. Uh, but what I, d- what I don't want to do too much of either is to um, uh, pr- promote events that aren't necessarily locked in yet. So there are a lot of things that are kind of almost there and you just got to take your time. I want to go full tilt and talk about San Francisco right now, but that will get in the way of Melbourne. That's tomorrow. Okay, so it's Melbourne right now. It gets its turn. Um, and so probably the bandwidth I have is only for a couple of events a month. Otherwise, I get I'm talking about it almost too much and it, and it becomes a bit like a bit boring. Um, but I think that the strategies to line everything up is I'll have like a, a group call 
with the speakers, uh, which we did with Melbourne the other day, just check if things in place. But really what I do is make sure myself and the team will do it all for them. So, you know, the, the run of uh, slides if they're needed, um, you know, the setting up the venue, attendance, everything, just do it myself. And then the speakers, they know when they need to show up, they know when they're on to speak, they're given a running order, it's all nice and simple. So um, these things don't need to be difficult. But what you do need to do if you're running an event or marketing event is you need to lead, which means you need to be the one who actually produces it. Um, so I think that's important to understand. Otherwise what happens is you end up um, hoping that people are gonna go and do stuff for you. And I have some great people in the network, but it's always important to, to kind of take the lead and, and own the event, I suppose. I'm just gonna draw a line there because we're finishing up uh, early because I've got, I've got a couple of meetings coming out. But thank you very much for watching today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you everyone who's listening on the podcast. I feel like more people are now jumping into the podcast, which is really lovely. So this is, becomes an audio version a bit, a bit later on today. Uh, and also check out the newsletter, some really solid content this week. Uh, and that's on therichardmore.com forward slash slash newsletter. Congratulations to those of you who are just amazing people running the Melbourne event. So Tina, Christina and Diana, thank you for running that. Entrepreneur Business Live Melbourne will be on tomorrow at 6 p.m. Australia time. There is an event set up in the Entrepreneur Business Group here on Facebook. If you want to um, watch the replay uh, or grab the real event, uh, you can you can log yourself in there and do that. And I will be able to see you on the live stream. But otherwise, thank you very much. Have a great day and I'll catch you soon.